joining us for our next hour uh, and our next presentation is uh, Patrick Manley of the Copernic Astronomic Society. Uh, Patrick, you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. I can. All great. Right. I'm going to mute myself and let you take it from here. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we get some clearing of the sky tonight and, and we can enjoy some observing. Uh, we cannot see this wonderful object right now quite yet. Uh, as far as the sun goes uh, but you know maybe at some point here we, we will be able to do some of the things that i'm going to go cover today in observing the sun um the sun's kind of a unique thing it's a lot different than uh you know what we traditionally see uh for for astronomy it's a singular object but we're so close to it it is ever changing whereas a lot of the activity that's going out in space and deep space in particular there's not a lot of change going on there. Um, but with our sun, there's always a lot of change going on it, and there's a lot that we can look at, observe, keep track of, and monitor. Um, so about me really quick, I'm a loving father and husband. Uh, I love astronomy uh, and, and all things space. Um, you know, as far as I'm a chief architect at Lockheed Martin and vice president of technical affairs in the Copernic Astronomical Society. I'm an avid amateur astronomer, as I already said, and also an amateur astrophotographer. Um, and I love meteorites, uh, you know, some, a, a big passion of mine as well. And anything about space exploration and science fiction. Um, you can see a couple of pictures of me here with my with my 16 inch telescope at Cherry Springs State Park, which is a dark sky park. Uh, you can see me standing very, very close to a uh, space shuttle Atlantis. Uh, I could have hit it with a baseball if I had a baseball on me. Um, I was lucky enough to be selected for a, what was known back in the day as a tweet up uh, to see the second to the last launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis uh, from the NASA press corps site. So that was really awesome. Um, and, uh, and I spend a lot of time at Copernic, uh, you know, leveraging some of the equipment and features and capabilities they have up there. I've also built my own sm much smaller and less robust as Copernic, um, but I've also built my own observatory with my own telescope and equipment mounted in it. Uh, down in northern Pennsylvania, uh, about a half an hour away from me. Uh, so quick stones throw and off I go to the, to the observatory on many clear nights, especially during the darker windows. Um, I'm also starting to fit it up for uh, uh, solar observing as well. So that should be pretty exciting as I move into that effort. Um, some of the photographs that I've taken, I mentioned I was an amateur astrophotographer. You know, you have the heart nebula up in the uh, upper left there. Uh, the, and I, these were all taken from my observatory, except for the two wide fields. And then Jupiter, uh, it was, I took that image of Jupiter where you can see the moon shadows as well as the moons um, that are going across the surface of Jupiter. Uh, so that was an excellent image. Um, you'll see an aurora shot in the lower left and, that, and then a nice dark night uh, Milky Way shot from Cherry Springs State Park uh, with my tent in front there. This is my most recent image I did, just completed processing that about a week ago, uh, two weeks ago rather, it's the Vail Nebula. Uh, so that gives you an idea of some of the capabilities I can do uh, for my observatory uh, down in Kiev. I'm gonna put this slide in here. I can't think about solar observing or solar astronomy without thinking of, of a person who, who has uh, uh, passed away in the recent years. We, we have a memoriam for him in Copernic Observatory. Uh, he has engaged and energized people in amateur astronomy, as, but primarily in solar observation. Um, you know, Barlow Bob was a fantastic figure. He's taught me a lot about solar observing and a lot about some of the science behind the sun. Uh, and he did so freely, traveling from to schools and, and astronomy festivals uh, all over New York State and Pennsylvania. Uh, to do that. So the, I'm going to make this chart back in memory to him. One disclaimer as we get moving on, I don't know what the expertise level of the folks on the call is, but it's important to know that solar observing can be very dangerous, right? They, you know, never look directly at the sun with the naked eye, especially with binoculars or with a telescope, um, unless you have the proper solar filters in place and you're confident. Um, you know, you can easily cause permanent and irreversible eye damage as well as a camera as well as a telescope for that matter as i have in the note below um you know and that damage may happen and it's irreversible right and never use your telescope for binoculars to project an image of the sun onto any surface 
there are some safe ways of doing this, but if you're not 100% certain uh, on what you're doing, you may incur a very expensive loss um, if you're not sure of your equipment. So the sun benefits us in many ways. You know, uh, the, the, the most important couple of ones are it's the gravitational center of our solar system and it provides our planet with a, a boundless amount of energy or so it seems. Um, and it shelters the earth from comets and asteroids. And there's a whole slew of these other uh, activities that we can see that we experience every day where we have these positive effects. But at the same time, the sun is also a very powerful uh, entity, right? And so how do, it can also harm us if we're not careful. The most obvious ones are sunburn, uh, you know, poisoning, damage to the skin over a long period of time, including cancer, recalls, and other, other effects on skin. Um, if it's a real hot day and you get dehydrated and too hot for too long a period of time, you might experience sunstroke or heat strokes. Um, you know, it can cause magnetic interruptions, which can lead to power failures, uh, communications issues, uh, all sorts of uh, activities like that. And it can disrupt and damage our satellites that we depend heavily on in our modern world. And, and there's a lot of other impacts here that, that you know, we're very well in tune with and are, are aware of, and we're trying to manage the risks for all of them as much as we can. Some of them we can't stop and we don't know when the next impact might come, but we try to deal with these things and manage them as much as possible uh, to not allow that boundless source of energy to cause more problems you know, for us. Now, where are we in this? So here's, a, here's kind of an, a sketch of the Milky Way, a simulated image of it. You know, if you look at these cylinders over here, there's one cylinder to the left and one to the right there. The big one to the right, you kind of think of that as our galaxy, right? And our, our local group of galaxies, I'm sorry, the big cylinder is our uh, universe, right? And in that big cylinder are, is our local group of galaxies. Um, and those galaxies can, you know, uh, include ours, the Milky Way, as well as the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy and a couple others. Um, and in, in the Milky Way, right about there is right about where we suppose we are based on what we can observe and what we can see. And so you, here you can see the sun. Uh, well, actually, you really can't because it's a, it's a fairly small star. Um, but right about there is where we believe it would sit and lie in this image. And that would include our entire solar system. And it kind of gives you a sense of scale, right, as to how big everything is out there. Uh, you know, as big as the sun is to us, it's really important to us. It's really not that huge on that on that level. Some vitals about the sun, I'm not going to go through these in detail. I will say it's a magnitude minus 30, which makes it the brightest thing in our night in our sky. Um, it's massive, about 109 Earths can go across the equator, you know, the sun's equator. Um, you know, it, you can fit about 1,300,000 Earths inside of the sun. Uh, so it's a massive volume uh, for its size, and its mass is, you know, 300,000 Earths. I mean, that's that's insane. It's kind of funny that I rounded that number down, if you think about it, it's, it's how big it is, right? Its surface temperature is approaching between 9 and 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Its core temperature is about 28 million degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then, it, you know, and the corona temperature is out towards the outer end limits of the, of the sun's quote-unquote atmosphere. Um, is about can be anywhere between 1.7 million and 17 million degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, massive numbers that you know we can't even wrap our heads around most of the time. Of the 50 nearest stars within 17 light years of us, um, the Sun ranks fourth in mass. So, although I said it's a small star, it's actually you know it's actually a little bit above average, if you will. Uh, you know, at least in our nearest neighborhood, if you, you know, if you consider that. The sun orbits the center of the Milky Way galaxy at a distance of 24,000 to 26,000 light years away. That's kind of amazing, right? And it's galactic, and it's galactic, it orbits the galactic center in about 250 million years. So yeah, none of us will ever see that. <laughs> um, it takes a single photon between 10,000 years and 170,000 years to get from the core of the sun to the surface where it's released and we call it light, right? That's, that's an amazing staggering number. Uh, if you can think of the number of photons that are contained in that in that equation. And the sun processes about 600 million tons of hydrogen each second at the core. That's, you know, these numbers are, are you know, thumb in the air type numbers, but it's staggering, right? Um, you know, the, the sun has an anatomy. We're going to talk about some of these to kind of get a feeling for how it works and what it's doing. 
at its core, it has a core, it has a radiative zone where the light, the energy travels out from that, that core, which is the core is basically a nuclear reactor. There's a radiative zone that the energy transfers through the, the, the tends to cool the activity that's going on in that core. There is a convective zone uh, where a lot of cooling occurs and that's how a lot of the material and energy is transferred to the surface of the sun. Um, there's the photosphere, which is the surface part of the sun. Um, and then the chromosphere, which is very fairly close to the photosphere. Um, and you can, and that's what we oftentimes observe. And then you have the corona, uh, which is, is more, we were just talking about that. It's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, part, the atmospheric part of the sun, if you want. Again, I put quotes around that, that analogy. Um, and then you have granulars of prominences and sunspots, and we'll get into those in a few slides. How does the sun work? At its core, like I said, it's a nuclear reactor fueled by nuclear fusion. It can, it's only 25% of the sun's mass, but it generates 99% of all the heat and energy and the whole process that, you know, that, that keeps our planet uh, warm and comfy and cozy, right? It generates 383 yottawatts uh, per second. Um, you know, that's a lot of watts. <laughs> Lots of zeros there, uh, a ridiculous number, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's just, again, part of that awe, of, you know, of what the sun is and, and that thing that cozies us up every, every, you know, every day as we walk through it and under its, its energy and its influence, right? The radiative zone, again, I said its energy is, it, it literally is radiated through the, through the mass that's in that zone and, it, and that mass provides cooling. It's a, a great deal of energy is lost uh, in this, and in, in the radiative zone is about 50% of the sun's volume. Um, and there's not enough energy for convection to occur though, uh, as it's transferring through. But then we get into the convection idea, and I'm not gonna go into a great deal of the science, but it's a lot like a boiling pot of water. The bubbles come up on one side and go back down through either the center or another side, depending on what you're making. Um, you have, in these regions right in here, you have this convection zone where you have these heat currents that form and they push the energy out to the sun, right? Out towards the surface of the sun. And that's how it all escapes and gets out of there. And that's when we start seeing light and all, sort, and all sorts of other effects that are emitted, including things, you know, uh, you know, energetic particles are released, X-rays and gamma rays can be released, um, neutrons, there's all sorts of stuff in here that can be released at that point, uh, or neutrinos, I'm sorry, I said neutrons, neutrinos. Um, and there's a lot of other x-rays, I think I already said that, and, and radio emissions are also sound and other activities, or other materials are released at that point. What is the sphere? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the visible surface of the sun, right? Uh, visible light is able to emit into the space, as I said before, tens of hundreds of kilometers thick, um, depending where you are and, and where it's at. The sun appears brighter towards the center and darker towards the outside of the disk. You know, we're seeing more of the material on the center, so it radiates with more, uh, you know, uh, light in those regions. Whereas here, we're seeing a little bit less of that material at John. If we were looking straight on through here, it would be the same effect, right? So in this center region in here, it looks a lot more lit up and as you get to the edges, not so much so. And how does it work? Um, you know, the chromosphere basically, you know, how does the chromosphere work? It's nearly opaque and has a reddish tint to it actually. Uh, you leverage different kind of filtered uh, filters on the imaging if you're imaging it. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, and it's, you know, much hotter than the photosphere. And it, that's where we see the, the, and we'll talk about prominence and filaments in a little bit here. Uh, and that's where you see those uh, residing. And then the corona extends millions of kilometers into space. I, again, we talked about how hot it gets there. It's extraordinarily hot in that area, right? It's best seen during the solar eclipse. You can actually see it in the magnetic waves which go through it here. Um, so you can see all sorts of magnetic waves coming off of here, you know, at that solar eclipse, uh, um, you know, uh, timing, you know, when, when you're at totality. Um, and lots of magnetic activity going on in that in that corona, and I'll have some I'll have a really neat image that shows that later on. Um, some of the features of the sun again I'll put my disclaimer in here just in case you came late. 
never look directly into the sun with the naked eye binoculars or with a telescope unless you have the proper solar filters in place. Permanent and irreversible eye damage can occur. You can also damage your equipment, cameras, telescopes, and other things. So, you know, just throwing that in, in case somebody joined late, I want to make sure that we continue to hammer that. We will see that slide a few more times just in case you're not sick of it yet. Um, intriguing observations that have occurred in the sun, you know, uh, here you can see some planets in front of the sun. One, one person, and I, I'm really upset, I really wanted to get our image credit over here for this one. Um, you know, he also caught a, a plane in there, so that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, good day when, when weird things like that happen, right? But we can see the, the you know, either, either Venus or Mercury, we can see those planets because they're between us and the sun. So every once in a while, we can image them and see them pass between us and the sun. Um, there's a guy out there, his name's Terry Legault. Uh, he makes some beautiful art and he basically captures, uh, you know, objects going between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, he times out when the International Space Station, when we had the shuttle program going, he would get the shuttles. I'm sure he's trying to figure out how to get the current space capsules as well, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the new era um, of space, of, you know, low Earth orbit travels. Um, but he does an amazing job. If you've never researched Terry's work, it's amazing. I really recommend you take a look at it. Also, our very own upstate New Yorker, uh, Alan Friedman from Buffalo, New York. Um, he does uh, amazing uh, solar and planetary imaging from his backyard. Uh, another person to uh, uh, research and look into. Uh, you, I could spend days just going through his galleries, observing the sun that way without doing any work at all. Uh, really amazing photographs. He really has the capability to draw and bring out and turn this into art. Uh, you know, definitely plays with the colors and whatnot to get the right contrast so that you see certain features and capabilities. But I highly recommend if you, if you want another, uh, re, you know, research homework assignment, Alan Friedman is really an amazing uh, astrophotographer to, to research. He's had, new, by the way, he's had numerous dozens of astronomy pictures of the day. So <laughs> um, again, setting the gold standard for uh, solar imaging. The solar cycle is another thing that we can monitor and observe. Excuse me. Um, that the basic idea is, is you get sunspot activity. So if you look here, they're small, but they're there. What one of the reasons I showed this picture is as you see here, we got small little sunspots here. Um, this small one right here, that's about the size of the earth, right? So you could probably put 109 of those across here, right? So just to kind of get it out here that you can barely see this one, but it's there and you can see it. So, um, you know, but if you look on here, we can count, there's one here, there's a couple up here um, and we count these sunspots. And basically the idea is, is we keep a running count over the calendar year of those sunspots and they've been doing this. What's the number there? I gotta get close to see it, 1750. Uh, they've been doing this since 1750. We've been keeping records of the number of sunspots that appear on the sun. Um, you can see that there's a definitive cycle, not always predictable how many you're going to get, but there is a definitive cycle here um, that's occurring that we can see it, and we call that the solar cycle. And so we keep counts of those sunspots. We've also noticed that you know some of the other things we're going to talk about also occur more feverishly when the sunspot counts are higher. And so we can use this as a good as a good uh, uh, tool to say when we're going to be entering the times of highest solar activity, right? Um, and then also every year they did it, and they did pretty much nail the shape of of the two of this like of this solar cycle 24 here that ran roughly between 2009 and 2019. Uh, typically, you'll see them run. You'll notice these are running at about 11 years. That's the typical. The last one was a little bit shorter for whatever reason. Um, they actually, they nailed pretty good solar cycle 24. Uh, and they're predicting 25 is going to look a lot more like solar cycle 24. So we'll see how well their predictions are um, based off their, their, their models. So very, very intriguing idea and something that you can observe and keep track of. Um, I'll show you a couple sites if you're interested in monitoring the, sun, the sunspots uh, later on in the presentation. So what are sunspots? They're not really black. Um, that's kind of a visual thing that occurs for us. Um, 
from the way our eyes work, there are temporary areas where the surface temperature is just a little bit cooler. So they're not really black, but they're, they're they, you know, from a contrast perspective, they appear dark, even though they're not. Um, and they look like darker spots that we can find. Um, you'll see in some of the images that I show later on that you can start to see that they're not really that dark when you start processing the image correctly. Um, so how, how did they get there? You know, extreme mag magnetic destabilization occurs in that area and, and it pours on, you know, this magnetic impact effect in, in, a, in a large region. Like I said, it's, it's not a small surface area. It's like the size of the earth was the small one I showed you in the last image, right? So it's a significant event on the sun. It stops and slows the convection that we were talking about in those regions for whatever reason. I'm not totally sure why that is. And that's one of the areas of studying with the sun. But that surface temperature cools a little bit and the region loses some of its luminosity, making it appear darker, as I said before. Um, and then that cycle is usually typically broken, either a flare or a coronal mass ejection occurs. And we'll talk about what those are in a moment. So again, some more pictures of sunspots. Uh, here's one similar to the one that I showed before. Uh, you know, not quite so many, not quite so dramatic, mostly Earth-sized sunspots. They can get a lot bigger and a lot more furious and a lot more activity. Um, sometimes like over here, you can see where there was probably, it started out one, two, you know, and a bunch of them here, but then they kind of joined together in a group, a little network of destabilization, where this one's really obvious where you can see that destabilization occur. And it can get really extreme at times. Um, here's some examples of some, some very extreme ones. This is from 2001, uh, where you have these, these sunspot groups where they have just, you know, turned into, uh, you know, really extreme uh, changes on the surface of the sun. Uh, and then here's one from 2010, uh, you know, again, not that ferocious, but still a magnificent thing to observe, right? If you have a telescope that's safe to do with solar astronomy, um, you know, the, the, they're great objects to observe. So solar prominent prominences and filaments, a prominence is connected to the sun's photosphere. We talked about that, right? Just the surface and it extends into the corona. Um, they consist of plasma that is slightly cooler than the corona itself. It's very common for it to form a loop or sometimes they call it, you know, these little groupings of trees or just a single element. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at some photographs of that in a moment. And it normally takes about a day to start up uh, once it's stable, they can last. Uh, they can last up to months if it gets real stable. Sometimes it could just be a, a you know half a day or a couple hours. Um, really depends on the nature of the filament and how stable it's able to get. And and, and a filament is a different term that they use. It's really just uh, in a, in a, it's that's easier to look at it. Um, so when we go through here, you can see a lot of different features on the sun here. Um, over here is a jet you know, a singular jet, maybe it's got a few things and it's just shooting out a whole bunch of plasma out into the corona. And it, all, it doesn't detach normally, but it stays there. It doesn't really go anywhere. Um, and then over here is a filament. And if I get my mouse, you can see this is a big filament too, right? So you can see here's the filament and there's little traces of it. Here's another filament over here. And there's one or something going on through here and one up here too, right? So these things are really just like this one over here, except we're looking at them at John, if that makes sense. And so a filament is basically, you know, a, a prominence that we're looking at at John. Uh, it just took a while before they confirmed it. This is a ring or on the other side, they called it a loop. Um, and then if you look over here on the side, and there's a couple of these areas actually, uh, you know, you have these wisps and then you have trees. And what the trees really are, they're forest or trees, they call them. Um, they're just little groupings of either wisps or these jets. Like you see a smaller jet up here, for example. These trees or the forest is just a collection of those jets all happening together. So lots of different activity. Uh, when you see these things on the sun, you know, visually or photographically, it's, it's pretty awe-inspiring. Um, and, and again, this is a changing thing, right? It's not like the, the nebula shot that I had earlier. Uh, this is a changing thing. Um, and here's a zoomed in view of a high resolution loop from the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, lots of detail, lots of activity going on in there. Uh, you know, these things can really get moving um, and changing uh, quite easily. 
So, and then the last one is the solar flares and CME, coronal mass ejection. So solar flare is basically, it typically occurs near those active regions of sunspots that I showed you. The bigger the region of the sunspot, the bigger possibility that this is gonna occur um, and, and, and the larger the magnitude of the solar flare. It affects all layers of the solar, of the solar atmosphere um, and it's fueled by the release of that magnetic energy disturbance that we were talking about. It'll release that and the material will come shooting off uh, of, the, of the sun's surface. Um, what happens with a coronal mass ejection now, a solar flare doesn't necessarily need to release the material out into space, but a coronal mass ejection is basically just that. It's a sudden release of that plasma and magnetic energy into space. It hurls that, in, you know, and that process can happen. It's kind of, kind of freaky, but it can happen within minutes to tens of minutes, like from start to finish. So it's moving a lot of material very quickly when the, pheno when the phenomena occur. Now, interestingly enough, is these coronal mass ejections, they can be earth pointed. Um, and when they are earth pointed, that's when we start to see uh, significant aurora uh, impacts on the earth. In the northern hemisphere, we have the aurora borealis. In the southern hemisphere, I think they call it aurora australis, if I'm not mistaken. Um, those earthbound CMEs can travel from 15 hours to several days uh, in time. Uh, you know, and it can be greenish or reddish light uh, once it impacts on the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the solar wind kind of funnels down to the northern or southern pole, depending what's going on there, right? So you can see both the northern and southern poles there. Um, for us, it's the northern pole. And it, and it follows the magnetic field lines until it gets to that pole area. And that's when it hits the, uh, you know, the magnetic field and we start to see it interact with our atmosphere. The coronal mass ejection and solar flares, uh, you know, they, they bring a lot more energy into the picture. So we always have kind of this aurora impact, aurora effect at the northernmost parts of the northern hemisphere, right? The aurora borealis. They always have that up in, that, in those regions. They always have some flavor of it. Uh, it may not always be that bright, but it, it's likely there in some magnitude. But when you get these coronal mass ejections, they can add a lot of lot more energy to that effect. And we can see the Aurora Borealis coming down even down as far as, as where we live here, um, you know, in upstate New York. Uh, the Aurora Borealis can be anything from, you know, very mild, like I was saying before, that are just, you know, and beautiful to overwhelming uh, in color and activity. Um, you can kind of see the one reason why I like this photo here, this is an astronomy picture of the day. Uh, one of the reasons I like it is you can see all the green light on the snow and the ice. It gives you an idea of exactly how bright that, that phenomenon was. Um, and these shots that you're going to see here, and I'm just going to slowly go through them while I talk about them. I, I was out observing in, uh, I was actually imaging in the uh, Thousand Islands uh, along, you know, near Alexandria Bay in the St. Lawrence River. Uh, so that's the St. Lawrence River you see there. Um, and I was actually trying to image and I was at first I was really frustrated because all I could see are these pink lights. I'm like, what is this pink garbage in my image? Um, I'm trying to get this Milky Way shot off and I was like, do this see pink. And then it clicked with me. I saw the chartreuse color and I'm like, well, no, that's an odd color. You don't see that very often. And then I knew what it was. And so I shifted my imaging night for this. It was just complete luck and happenstance that a coronal mass ejection slammed in and brought all this down as far as the, you know, St. Lawrence River anyways. And here's some other images of it. You can see uh, the impacts, lots of different colors in there. The color, you get different colors due to the ionization of different gases. Um, I can never remember which gases cause which colors, but it has to do with electron energy levels in those gases, and then they can change colors. But you can see here, one of the reasons I like this one is you have the green that you usually associate with an aurora. You have some extreme yellow down here little of that chartreuse color I was talking about. And then you have some reds over here and some purples over in here. So pretty much that night, and I, there was a lot of people who caught it um, actually, and everybody was getting a lot of different colors that night. So it's kind of a rare event. So here's one same image, same processing technique. And you can see the extreme purples that were in it rolling through. These these pillars here are really wild. They, they fluctuate in a wild way. Um, so those are my images that I was lucky enough to get uh, taken of, of the Aurora Borealis. Uh, it, I highly recommend anybody into astronomy to try to find a way to 
uh, witness that both photographically and visually. Uh, visually, there's not anywhere near as much color, by the way, just to make sure we're clear there. It mostly looked greenish um, in color uh, visually, but it was still an amazing. You could see the pillars as clear as day. Uh, so another phenomenon that we can observe is a solar eclipse. Um, there's different types of, of solar eclipse. There's a total eclipse like we saw back in 2017, much across the Americas. Um, you don't, not everybody always sees a solar eclipse in the same way. Uh, you know, some folks may see it as a partial or a total, um, you know, depending on what's going on. I know I, I observed 2017 from upstate New York, so I only saw a partial. So that's kind of like the C over here. A total where it reaches totality looks like this. And then the annular is when the moon's shadow appears, you know, in the disk of the sun, but it's much smaller. So you, it doesn't actually block the sun out. Um, one thing I'm going to say is even though there may be an eclipse, still very dangerous to look directly at the sun or use your equipment, point your equipment directly at the sun. Uh, so again, just plugging that in there again, be careful. The only time you can look directly at the sun actually is when you have a total eclipse and it's for a very short window. So you have to know how long it's gonna take um, because totality could be anywhere from 20 seconds to 20 minutes, right? Depending on the event. So you have to be really careful there. And again, you can look at it only during totality. Any of these other photographs, if you looked at it visually, you would hurt your eyes irreversibly. So a uh, neat image I always found pretty neat. Here's a solar eclipse image shot. This is a total solar eclipse, but it's shot from the International Space Station. And so you can actually see this, the shadow of the moon uh, on the Earth's surface uh, during that total eclipse. So that I always like including this photo because it's, it's, we don't think of it that way usually as far as what's going on in the eclipse. So if you think back to that Jupiter picture that had my moon shots on it going across the surface of Jupiter, same thing here. Uh, so kind of neat. Um, in 2017, the KAS was very uh, active in the solar eclipse. I just grabbed two images really quick from Lee Shelp and Marianne Marcunas. Uh, they uh, traveled to, I believe it was Nebraska, if I remember right, and they went with a large group of KAS members who went eclipse hunting. Uh, over here in Lee Shot, you can see, uh, oops, sorry, it's fast. Over here in Lee Shot, you can see the uh, magnetic field lines really clearly. Um, you know, a very interesting phenomenon that, that happens there. And, and then Marianne has what's known, I, I think they call it the diamond ring or something like that, that happens just before totality and just after totality. Um, here is an animation. I'm not sure how well it's coming through. It's a 15, 15 shot animation of totality. So you'll see real quick blips um, on it. So uh, where it's real bright at the top and the bottom. And then you can see if you look really close, you can even see a little transitioning of the magnetic field lines. Um, be glad to share the link to this. These are taken by Sean Walker. He had one on the pre previous slide too. He works for uh, Sky and Telescope Magazine, a very good friend of the members of the KAS. But this image always just blows my mind. He did such a good job processing it and getting the data for it. Um, you know, an amazing set of images. Um, there's a total solar eclipse coming up on April 8th, 2024. It's gonna go right over parts of the US. Uh, when it goes over, it will we'll cross over upstate New York, not Binghamton. So Binghamton is over here, right, in this area. If you go up to Cortland, you're getting very close. If you go up to Syracuse region and, you know, west of there, you're going to be in the lane of totality. So uh, there's a very small lane on every total solar eclipse that has the totality uh, phenomena in it. Um, and so we'll be able to do a very short trip somewhere, you know, and, and be able to observe it here in upstate New York. So very much looking forward to that. Um, of course, you have to chase the weather and we all know how the weather is here in upstate. But I will tell you this, odds are if it's cloudy down in here, odds are it's clear up in here. So be ready to drive. <laughs> So observing the uh, solar or observing solar, uh, yeah, like, as I've been saying throughout, <laughs> here it is again, very important. Never look directly into it. Naked eye binoculars or with a telescope unless you have proper solar filter in. If you're unaware of the proper operation or the equipment to use, 
then feel free to reach out to us at Copernic in the Copernic Astronomical Society, and we can review your equipment. But if you look through it before you're positive, you can cause permanent and irreversible eye damage. Um, you know, it's always smart to test your equipment too, uh, to make sure that, that you're not going to get it. It's better to burn a hand than it is to burn an eye or, or a camera for that matter, given the expense of cameras. Um, so, you know, and again, other safety, important solar observing guidelines, ensure that the solar observing equipment is not defective. As I said, better to test with a hand than it is to test with your eye. Ensure all the equipment is placed and assembled properly. Um, we've had KAS members burn pant legs, um, you know, in the past and handling their equipment. So you have to be very careful of this. It's a, this is a real deal. This is a real thing. I'm not just throwing it out there for liability. Um, and solar star parties, how am I doing? Oh, I'm doing great. So solar star parties are gatherings of amateur astronomers who like to observe the sun. They often set up in public places where other people can come out and join in and they bring their equipment out and their knowledge and their understanding of the sun and will gladly show anyone from the public, you know, what's going on there. What, you know, what, what are they looking at? What are the differences from scope to scope of what you're looking at? You know, are you looking at the photosphere, the chromosphere? You know, what are you observing? Um, so solar star parties are a great way if you don't, as you'll see when I go over the next slide, solar observing equipment is not cheap because of that liability, that safety factor. Uh, so there's a lot of expense associated with it. So keep your eyes peeled for solar star parties and you can observe the sun and these phenomena, you know, for free uh, at these activities and gatherings. White light filters, some of these are very simple. They can go on the edge of any kind of telescope. Uh, down here in the lower left, we have what are known as Botter paper uh, solar filters. Uh, Botter Planetarium is a company that makes the material and there's a variety of people who make uh, the solar filters from it. You have to be very careful with this. It's kind of like a really thin mylar. Um, and you have to be careful because little holes can get poked into it. Uh, and that's where you have to make sure you're testing your eyepiece. Like I said, better to burn a hand than an eye. Um, so that's these ones here that are paperish. You can also buy glass white light filters as well. Um, the, the, and this one here is a glass one. Um, and these glass ones uh, are much safer uh, activity. Um, I know we use a lot of these and we have to step in between each person at Copernic when they're observing with these types of filters. You just gotta make sure some you know, some little hands didn't come up and touch it and poke a hole in it or anything like that. <laughs> um, something to keep an eye on. These can be very, these are very affordable though, from $15 to $150. You can buy the Mylar paper, uh, the Botter paper. You can buy that for even a cheaper expense and make one yourself if you want to. Just safety first, right? Um, and you can image. So once you have the paper on there, you can, you know, here's a view of what you might see. You can see a little bit of the granularity on the sun's surface. You can see a little bit of the detail on the sunspots and whatnot, um, but not a great deal of detail, but you can see some, right? And that's kind of, a, that's kind of gives you a, a feel of what that uh, investment would get you. Um, as you move forward, you can buy also what are known as Herschel wedges. And a Herschel wedge is basically a prism that filters out the damaging infrared light uh, from uh, you know, everything that you're looking at. And uh, you can't, oops, you can't see it well. Oh, you can see it on this one. See this little piece of metal right here? It had, each one of these has a heat sink on it that that dangerous energy goes to, and it dissipates off as heat. These little heat sinks can get to be a little bit warm at times. But, you know, the basic idea here is that we move, you know, that you remove all the dangerous light and can look through it. These can range anywhere from 300 to $700 depending on the kit and what you're buying. If you're using it for astrophotography, you might want to spend a little extra money to get a kit with some filters, some special filters in it to help it match your CCD sensor or your uh, you know, camera sensor uh, better. Um, the other thing that these do is they, since they're a reflection, not a filter, a filter takes away light, right? These do not take away the, the light and the details. So the botter paper and the glass ones that you saw are filters. They take away resolution and detail. These do not take away as much resolution or detail. And so you get a lot more detail. You can see a lot more of the granularity and spicules on the, on the sun. You can see a lot more detail around the solar, the sunspots. Um, Copernic does have a botter 
uh, Herschel wedge edit that we use quite often uh, when we do solar observing. So lots more detail in here, lots to look at, um, you know, it, is it, and it really pops out a lot better. A much better uh, instrument for imaging than, than the filters that I showed you. The Herschel wedges work a lot better. Now you can take existing telescopes and buy uh, H-alpha filters for them. And there's a variety of these. I didn't even put a fifth of the ones that are out there that you can use. Um, so these allow you to see a lot more detail on things like sunspots, flares, spicules, the models, uh, you know, the, 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 the weird uh, features that you get near the sunspots are called plage. You can see more of that. The filaments and prominences as well that we were talking about before. You get a lot more detail out of it. Um, and a lot higher resolution because you're using a full-fledged telescope with this filter on the front. But they're expensive. They, they're very fairly expensive, anywhere between 1500 and 6000 And actually, I saw one. I was looking on the Daystar site. They have one of these that's, that's tuned, they call it. And that was actually $17,000. So you got to really want to do that, you know, to look at that one star, right? <laughs> so the, it does have a lot of expense for it but you can get a lot of great imaging done out of that, out of that approach. Um, and so you can see here uh, all the different types of details that you can get. Um, the ones that are tunable, the thing that that offers is it offers you to tune into a specific frequency of hydrogen alpha, which can, you know, you, you can either focus on the sunspots or you could focus on the prominences, right? Or maybe you want the, the more of the surface detail here and you can tune the bandwidth that you're using the, so that the filter passes through the right light for the object you want to focus in on. Um, now, Daystar more recently has offered up a, a, a little bit cheaper solution. And I was actually honored enough at an astronomy festival. I actually won one of these, so I was really happy about that. Um, and it was the year of the, of the eclipse, no doubt, too. This can be used visually or photographically. Um, it, you basically can take uh, your, your, if you have a refractor, an existing refractor, you can plug this thing into the back of the refractor, they, they call them quarks, and you can use them for imaging or visual observing. And it basically works really well. It is a nice, safe way to do it. Uh, they do cost about $1,100, so they're not for the faint of heart. And again, you really, really got to want to observe the sun or be really, really lucky like I was. Um, they also make them with different filters than just hydrogen alpha. Although hydrogen alpha shows you the most detail for the buck, if you wanted to collect all four of these for $1,100 each, you could take these photographs that you see here and look at different features of the sun all together. Each of these is the same basic region of the sun. Um, so these two spots or these two spots or these two spots. And you can see how the details and regions that you're looking at are, are fairly different. Um, so, so a fairly, you know, and I put air quotes around it, affordable approach to being able to do H alpha or other band passes if you wanted to. Um, and here's some examples, you know, of, of images that were taken with the Daystar quarks. And so here's the calcium H. You can see there's a lot of detail in here. And down here you can see the sodium D, lots of detail. And up here is the hydrogen alpha chromosphere, uh, which shows a lot of different types of details as well. So if you're really into this type of artistic solar photography, these are probably the devices you want and you can use them with your existing refractor telescopes. They also make dedicated solar telescopes, um, uh, you know, anywhere between $700 get you a very small aperture telescope, uh, all the way up to $10,000 can get you to a very large aperture telescope, you know, a six inch to eight inch. There's one out there, there was an eight inch refractor and I can't remember, it was much more than 10,000, but I don't remember its price, but it was much more, um, usually around six to seven inches. Again, this is a lot of money to invest in a single star because <laughs> you can only really use these for solar observing um, and imaging. You can't use these for deep space imaging. That's why this quark approach is nicer because I can use my refractor that I, you know, the nice refractor that I spent a lot of money on. I can use that for imaging night sky, planetary imaging, like the stuff you saw in my earlier photos, all the way down to solar imaging. If you invest in this path, you do get a better uh, image. Absolutely, positively, there's no argument there, but it's a lot of money to invest for getting that image. 
And here's an example of an image you can get with a dedicated large aperture uh, uh, solar scope. Uh, fantastic detail. Um, the reason for that being is the optics in the telescope are perfectly tuned for the filters that are applied to that telescope. Um, and so that that is what makes the difference here. And that's why you see all of this detail in this image, right? Uh, and it is pretty amazing. Um, you could do these shots over a period of time and create a time lapse. And, you know, over a period of hours, you could see some movement on the sun's surface. That's how detailed these are. It's pretty amazing. And then there's a, what's known as the personal solar telescope. There's two different forms on them. They both cost right around seven, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. Um, they're the best value for the casual observer. They're very small aperture. They're literally only like about two inches in aperture. Um, and, you know, there's still quite a bit of money, um, but you can see some wonderful views of the sun. I have one of these. I use it all the time. Uh, they're very quick and easy to set up. Uh, you can get it right out there. You can also image with them. Um, if you have a, you know, uh, you have to get good at doing it and bringing the thing into focus and stuff like that. But it is doable. There is a wrestling match that is required before you can image, but once you get good at it, figure it out, you're good to go. Um, and here's an example of an image taken with a personal solar telescope. Again, a really good, uh, uh, you know, amount of detail here, right? So a dedicated tune scope is definitively a better, better approach um, than moving forward with a bad, uh, you know, than, you know, hacking together a solution. But again, you got to make sure that you're going to you're willing to make the investment. Um, so I have three sites that I use for solar observing, um, and I actually have these. Okay, so here's the first one. Well, I'll do them in the order that I have listed in the presentation. Um, of course, it won't work when I'm trying. To, there we go. So the H Alpha Gong network can tell you if there's solar activity going on. There's basically, there's more than these seven that are showing up. I think there's a total of 12 telescopes around the world that could appear on here at any time, depending on their, on their, uh, you know. But you can see here, there's a little, prom a very small prominence there. Looks like there's a little filament here, something going on up in here. I'm not really seeing any, um, you know, big sunspots. But you can come out here. Oh, yeah, there's one right down here. I think that's a sunspot. That looks like a sunspot down there. Um, here's a filament there. A little something going on here. A filament over here, right? Maybe that's a sunspot region there, too. Um, but this can tell you if there's a lot going on in there. You can see that little prominence I was pointing to before is right here. Um, the activity that you see can tell you whether it's worth it to go out and set up, right? So we, we can see there's some filaments here. We can see there's a couple maybe sunspots here uh, that we could go observe and, uh, you know, try to uh, image or observe them visually, uh, you know, and this is what I do if I want to see if I want to go set up my PST is I come here first and I might go set up this day. There's some things here to see, but it's, it's not a real active day, right? Um, so, so that's the gong network of cameras, and you always have at least one, right? Um, that, that's good. So, so that can tell you whether there's something going on there. Now, if you want more detail about it, you can come over here, and that area that I was saying may be a sunspot, indeed is a sunspot. But here on spaceweather.com, this one tells you 2000, it's sunspot 2,776. Um, so that is definitely a sunspot here. Uh, so and we can click on that and blow that image up. So that is definitely a sunspot. They haven't given this one a designation, though, back on the Space Weather site yet. So this may not be a sunspot. Um, unless I'm missing something. No, I'm not missing anything. They haven't, it's, haven't declared it one yet anyway. So, so you can see that there's also a lot of other activity. Uh, there's these wonderful aurora galleries um, that, that you can go out and observe and, and admire. Uh, so there's always aurora activity that's going on. Uh, and they also cover other space news, usually space news relevant to our solar system. So you'll see stuff about Mars and some of the Mars activity that's going on, uh, close approach of, of near Earth objects, things of that nature they track on. So if you're not a monitor of space weather, I really highly recommend the site. Uh, it has a lot of entertainment to it.
Now, a lot of people want to know, how do I know if the Aurora is going to make it down to where I sit? So where I am, and you'll have to figure out what the numbers match for, for you and where you live. I have to be specific because I'm not in the room just talking upstate New York folks. But in upstate New York in general, uh, the lower half of the state here anyways, you go to this graph off of this site here, which is NOAA Space Weather site. And you go to this graph, it's called the KP index or the K index. And what you want to see for us, we want this chart to be hitting up here to the KP value. We want it to be hitting up around seven. If it's at six, we can look to the north and see Aurora up in the north, right? Um, when I was at the St. Lawrence River, that was a five. So it was only in the northern part of the sky, prominently in the northern part of the sky. Right? If it were at six, we might be able to see some coloring up at the very far north um, sky. And if it's a seven, it's above us. It's there. So get your camera out and start taking pictures. Um, so that's the, that's the KP index. There's other information on here about the sun, its activities, and the things that are going on. Um, and that, and again, this is called the, what is it, the Space Weather Prediction Center. Um, and I have these links in the presentation, which will, will be shared out with everybody. So this is a great site to go to for information about the sun. And uh, am I going to see an aurora or a geomagnetic storm, et cetera? Um, so that's my presentation. So those are the three sites that I like to use for solar observing. Um, and then, you know, wrapping up here out of 10 minutes of questions, uh, imaging the sun. Um, so I, definitely not enough time to go into it today, but solar imaging is very similar to the planetary imaging. So the process and workflow that I use to do that Jupiter image that I showed earlier on in the presentation, that is the, uh, there's a workflow there that I call planetary imaging or that's known as planetary imaging. Um, and basically when you're working with the sun, you would go for much lower gain and, and much shorter exposures, right? So, so you know, you really decrease the amount you do. The, the planets are not quite as bright as the sun. Um, so the sun is very bright as we know. So we don't need as much camera sensitivity to it. So we can back off on the gain and on the exposure time and image very similarly to the way that we would do planetary. Now, that's known where you actually, the process at the highest level is you take a video of the object and later on you process the individual frames to get your image. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into that today. That's about a two hour session in and of itself. Um, and then there's processing to be done afterwards. It's not just point and shoot. Uh, the reason for that is, is by the way, is atmospheric uh, disturbances cause the waves. If you've ever observed the moon, it also happens when you're observing the sun with these devices. Um, and you get these waves in the atmosphere, which distort the object and make it look out of focus. It may not be out of focus, but it might look that way. And by doing the lucky, they call it lucky video imaging. By doing that approach, you can just grab the best frames and combine them, uh, the ones that look like they're in focus. And so that's why we do it. So ZWO makes some planetary uh, cameras that you can use. Uh, I know Nick Gaidosh in, in the KS, he uses other types of cameras. Um, that, you know, basically web camera type things that shoot at, you know, faster than 30 to 60 frames per second. Um, the more frames per second you get, the more uh, chance you have of getting that one that's clear without the atmospheric disturbance in the lucky video image. Um, ZWOs have cameras that can go up to 200 frames per second. Um, so that's why I choose them and they're fairly affordable. There are other cameras that you can buy out there that are in the thousand to two thousand dollar range that can go up to much higher frame rates. Um, but I find these are adequate for, you know, uh, getting the, you know, some general amateur planetary photography done. You can also use your DSLR. If your DSLR, whether it be a Nikon or a Canon, I'm a Canon guy, so there's a Canon picture here. Um, if your Canon or Nikon can do video um, and, and, and send video through the USB connection, uh, you can also use uh, packages like Backyard EOS, or also you can use, uh, e Canon has its own video uh, uh, software that you can use to capture the video to your computer, right? Um, Nikon also, I believe, has a, a package out there that you can use to capture video uh, data from your Nikon camera with a PC or a Mac or something like that. Um, and then once you have the video on your thing, you're basically following the same kind of workflow here. 
So you can use DSLRs and mirrorless cameras as well. Um, sorry, my mouse is a little sensitive. So that's it, uh, you know, and for my second arm, just kidding, Drew. Um, you know, any questions for anybody, uh, you know, anything? I don't know, Drew, if there's anything coming through the chat window, it looks like there was a lot. Well, uh, let's see here. So we, I, I think uh, Art ended up, uh, can you hear me all? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, and I think I've got it so that people can actually hear me over the uh, YouTube stream. I'll tell um, you. <laughs> there was, I think we had uh, one question about solar wind, which actually Art, uh, I think, answered. Uh, there was another one, uh, another question by Mike asking, what causes gamma rays in the sun? I thought they were for, for they were from more intense processes. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, you know, I actually had a similar question on that. That's something I have not researched yet. Um, when I saw that chart from NASA, there was, it was, you know, and I looked, I zoomed right in on that image. It was a gamma symbol. So I'm not sure about the answer to that question, but it actually piqued my curiosity too as I was prepping for this. All right. Um, I actually wasn't going to say it, and then I did. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that, because I, I always thought it was mostly X-ray myself. So. All right. Actually, if you could stop sharing your screen, I wanted to show something to, uh, uh, to the people here that I had here. So uh, if I go to gallery view, here we go. Uh, so. Uh, for those of you who've ever used these little, you know, sunglasses, these solar, you know, glasses that uh, were very popular at the solar eclipse time, um, these are great when you look, you know, just directly at the sun. However, um, there was a person who used these glasses. Now you, you can sort of see it. There's two little dots. Uh, what that person did was they put the sunglasses on, and then they put a pair of binoculars up to try and see if they could get a, a closer view. But what happened was it literally burned holes through the film. And <laughs> fortunately for this gentleman, uh, it only sort of put some welts underneath his, uh, his eyes. It, he wasn't actually looking, you know, he didn't have it focused so that it was going into, into his eyes. But uh, these are only to be used, uh, you know, with, <laughs> just by, by themselves without any, uh, uh, any any extra uh, help, if you will, be binoculars or or, or a telescope without a, a, a uh, proper solar filter. So yeah, that could be really serious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, you know, I think we've we pretty much uh, have. So for Mike, I found something. Now this is my two-minute Google. Right, I'm on the spot uh, thing here, uh, and it is Wikipedia. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, as a result, the sun does not emit gamma rays from the, from the re reaction process, but it does emit gamma rays from solar flares. The sun also emits x-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, and even radio waves. So that, that's why, just solar flares, according to Wikipedia. All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. I really appreciate uh, your uh, putting this presentation together. It's always uh, very illuminating, a little sun joke there. Uh, and uh, so thanks again, and thanks all, also for all the work that you do up here at Copernic and, and uh, that all of the Copernic Astronomic Society uh, members do. Uh, you guys are really a phenomenal resource to us, and um, um, so hopefully when we can reopen, we can get uh, you engaged more with the public again. So Yeah, right. Soon all right.